Hello, everybody. Welcome to AFI Fest 2020 presented by Audi. I'm Eric Moore, a member of the programming team here at the festival. First, I want to thank our festival supporters, our presenting sponsor, Audi, our AFI members, and of course, you, our audience. So thank you all for being here. Um, we are very fortunate to have many, if not uh, most of the filmmakers for our Shorts 4 program joining us today. These films have been selected out of almost 3,000 films, and they're some of the best films out there today. We're super excited to be able to share them with you. And I'm going to ask the participants when I uh, introduce them to give a little wave. And then when we answer our first question, just repeat your name, the name of your film, and then let us know where you're joining us from, because we have some people from all around the world here today. So I want to introduce our filmmakers real quick. From Gramercy, I've got Pat and Jamil. You want to give a little wave? There we go. And from Correspondencia, I've got Carla and Dominga. Welcome. From LA Roll, I've got Helki. And from Chinese Wall, I've got Santiago. So awesome. So I'm so excited to be able to talk to you guys about these films. Um, one of the things about this program that I love is that all of your films in some way kind of deal with the idea of loss or potential loss. And each are very profound in their own way. And I'm curious if you could kind of talk a little bit about what made you choose the story of your film. Why, why this film um, as opposed to something else? We'll start with you, Pat and Jamil. It's a good, uh, it's a good question to to open with. Maybe the biggest question. Um, well, <laughs> first, I'm I'm Pat. I'm one of the writer, directors, and producers of Gramercy. Um, and who I, I think Jamil and I had been talking about this over the last couple of months, actually, about the kind of feeling, kind of where an idea comes from and why an idea how many ideas throughout the day you have that, that just disappear and you wonder where they go. And then there's this idea that stays with you for years and years. And then it, it come becomes all these little different ideas. And then, you know, so with Gramercy, it, it started with, uh, you know, I think Jamil and I were interested in making a film about the duality of existing in a lot of ways. I know that sounds quite broad, but we were very interested in, what it feels like to live an outer and an inner life at once and how those two things can sort of come up against each other very often, especially when you're living with depression and grief. Um, and so we were, we were very interested in that as a, as a canvas. Um, actually, the better analogy is probably that was the paint. And then the canvas sort of found us um, in, a, in a kind of happy accident. And, and Jamel, maybe you can speak a little bit more to, to that happy accident because, you know, you were the, you were the first one there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love the canvas and paint analogies, man. Um, but yeah, I think so everything that Pat said, um, yeah, essentially we kind of brought our paint to this canvas that kind of presented itself. Um, and I guess we got introduced to that canvas through a really good friend of mine from college um, and kind of introduced us to the world of Gramercy. Um, Cause I know one of the questions that a lot of people have is what is Gramercy? And um, to have a one or two sentence answer for me doesn't really like cut it. So uh, Gramercy is a lot of things. I think in short, maybe you could say Gramercy is this brotherhood that these guys had built um, and kind of made their own mark in this town in New Jersey called Piscataway. Um, but yeah, I, it's why this, why this canvas or why this story that kind of circled around grief. I think it's, it's every single point that Pat said. And it's, it's one of those things where it, as it found us, it just never went away and it kind of stuck around for two years and then ended up going into the third year of actually shooting it. And, it, it's one of those things that I know Pat and I have kind of talked about where it's interesting, like Pat was saying, that ideas kind of come and go. And then uh, there's some of them that stick and this just happened to be one of them. Um, but yeah, I, I don't really, other than the fact that it kind of found us, I think is 
is the whole thing about why Gramercy still exists today. There is, there's one thing on my mind, um, Eric, that you kind of said. Okay. All of our films kind of uh, have a theme of grief or some type of loss. And there's this Rumi, there's this collection of Rumi poems I've been reading lately. Um, and there's one that really stuck out to me. I actually just gave this book to Pat. But I took a picture of it and I just want to read it to everyone because I think that this could hold levity to the idea around grief. Uh, and this poem is called Bird Wings. Um, it's, your grief for what you've lost lifts a mirror up to where you are bravely working. Expecting the worse you look and instead here's a joyful face you've been wanting to see. Your hands open and close and open and close. If it were always a fist, or if we're always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and, ex and expanding, the two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as bird wings. And uh, I, I don't know, that, that poem kind of is just a reflection of kind of how we feel life where you have moments of grief, but those moments of grief could be relative to a contraction or an expansion. And we have those cycles that just keep coming and going. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we so much look at grief as a thing in which we don't want to happen or don't expect. Mm -hmm. And in its totality, that's actually what makes life in general. And that's what yeah. makes human existence in general. And I think to kind of look at grief, grief normally, as opposed to a thing that we're trying to avoid, but when it happens, we have a hard time dealing with I think it's a, a matter of normalizing that it's a thing that will always kind of come within your existence and will in turn just make the person that you happen to be at this given moment. So. And Eric, just one last point off of that, because Jamil, that just really reminded me of something that I think so much of, of film that is made um, about loss and, and grief is about thinking about the past or what's going to happen in the future. And I think we were really wanting to make a film about what grief feels like in the present moment in the realest sense and how it just feels to grieve and to feel lost and in cinema what does that look like and I think in in our film for example there's a lot of details that aren't there that in I think in a conventional story it's about you know what happened how did it happen why did it happen and I think more than anything else we wanted to make a film about just feeling grief and really feeling what that feels like and, and, and sitting with it and how it, it, it's so unpredictable and so um, defies logic in a lot of ways. And um, yeah, so that was, a, that was a big, big part of it too. Oh, thank you. Uh, that was lovely. And uh, yeah, Correspondencia, uh, Carla and Dominga, your, your film is obviously, uh, you know, not directly about grief, but it, but there's this kind of, loss about um you know normalcy to some degree and uh i don't know how did you find your story I, I, tell us a little bit about it yes <laughs> i know it's always awkward um, i think you're still mute um so well i i'm carla i come from spain i live in barcelona and, uh, and the idea of the film was actually a, a proposal from the, the Catalan TV, which is the local TV in my region. And um, they asked several women, basically, um, to do these kind of uh, film letters to each other. And, uh, and as a film, like there were different, uh, uh, like there was a photographer, an activist, uh, a writer, you know, and I was like the, the, the choice for the filmmaker. So as I knew Dominga's world and films, <laughs> I, I asked her if she wanted to, to, do, to exchange these letters with me. And, uh, and we had met just once, I think, in Rotterdam. So we didn't know each other that much, but suddenly it was like a way to, to really to get to know each other because film letters at the end, they are very intimate, like any letter. And, uh, and uh, in this proposal, the thing was to speak about women. But that was like the premise, that's all. And, uh, and because of our work, I suggested, uh, well, we, we spoke with Dominga and then at some point we said, what if we speak about the women in our families? And, uh, and my grandma died uh, like 
two months before uh, I shoot the first letter. And, uh, and it was a very um, important moment in my family because she was the last um, uh, grandmother I had. So the last person of this old generation. And I'm the oldest of uh, all my cousins and I ha don't have children. So nobody has children yet. So suddenly in my, in my family, there are two generations. Usually you have three at least or maybe four. <laughs> and, and so it's like, like, it was this moment where you, where you feel that uh, like this absent is very present for everyone in the family. And as women, because we are a lot of women in my family, um, it's, it's even bigger, you know, because there's something that just between us that passes from generation, from one generation to another, you know? So that was like, like the starting point to, to, to send the letter to Dominga and then we started this exchange and it became something else from the most intimate thing uh, to, to what was happening in Chile uh, when, when Dominga did the last letter. Hmm. Yeah. Dominga, yeah. do you want to add so, something? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, first, uh, thank you, Eric, and all your team. Like, it's, it's a great honor to be selected in this, mm -hmm. this nice group of short films. Uh, and Dominga, I'm in Santiago de Chile. And uh, as, uh, as Carla was saying, this was a very, I would say, very spontaneous project. I mean, uh, it was an invitation and we didn't know it going to be a film. We thought it going to be like, I don't know, a little correspondence, maybe for TV or for herself. So it's nice that now people can watch it, but it's also strange because it's really an intimate. <laughs> and <laughs> So yeah, Carla opened the question, no? We, we had this idea of talking about women, but she talked talk me about this recent loss of the grandmother. And then this, I was deeply connected with that feeling because I'm very close to my grandmother and she's getting old and she's a painter that is very important in my work. In my, it's, it's a great inspiration also for me. And also my mother that is an actress. So I think I like this idea of, letters as objects, no? It's something that you don't want to, to lose. And at the same time, we were trying to put or like, or more loves objects in that letter. So I think I was just playing with, this is the last material of my grandfather. This is my, like I was trying to show Carla through my, I don't know, the, the material that I, that I have in my hands of my story, of my family. And she was replying with her own. And so, yeah, that's it, and, and it was it was nice to to make something so fragile and so spontaneous for me. So we were just playing with I don't know. I was editing with a very simple like e movie and recording the the audio with my phone. So I think it was something very intimate, and yeah, and uh, for me at least, cinema has to do with capturing something that is kind of vanishing. No, so uh, regarding lost is. This is really connected with that. It was just just to make something to capture what we can forget or what what is is is, is living. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. And and about what oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I was just gonna add that about what the Dominga is saying is that uh, for me it was very uh, like important that moment when we. Uh, um, when, when we had to leave my grandma's flat because uh, I, I had been there like since I was born in that house, you know, like not living there, but going to visit her in that house. So a lot of things, things happen in that house and there used to be three people, my aunt, my grandpa, my grandfather and my grandma. So suddenly the fact that we were leaving this flat and someone was going to rent it uh, was like, oh, yeah. I have to capture something from this place and I have to do it in a very special way. That's why I decided to do it in Super 8. And, uh, and it was like a, like a perfect excuse to, to, you know, to express something, like to send a letter about that somehow. So I think that it is when you feel that something is about to disappear, it is like you have this desire to film it, no? So it stays. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's definitely like a fragility yeah. to your piece that is beautiful. So I think you captured it well. And then Helki with LA Roll, talk a little bit about kind of how you came to your story and, you know, the potential loss of this culture. Mm. I, I love that loss is framing all of this. It's like really moving. I, uh, I'm a roller skater and so I came 
to this story um, because I had been roller skating, you know, as a kid and then as an adult in various places. And when I moved to LA, I found the rinks and found, and there was this incredible dance skating scene that I had, I had never seen this style of skating before. Um, it's a very unique style of skating in Los Angeles. And, um, and then not long after I moved here, uh, my favorite rinks closed. Um, and, uh, my friend who I'd been skating with, who was also a cinematographer, um, you know, my, we decided that we needed to, we were wondering where people are going to go, you know, when the rinks close. And so we, that's, that's really the impetus was just seeing this incredibly, being part of this incredibly joyful skate dance culture and, um, and then seeing our spaces uh, disappear and we needed to, to know where people were going to go where and where we were going to go. Um, and, uh, so that, I mean, it's very simple in a way. It's just, this is the thing I love to do. And I wanted to know where, <laughs> where it was going to happen next. Um, yeah, but the, uh, that th we wanted to show this, you know, through the joy of this activity. And I think that in, in the joy, you know, you feel the loss more. I think you, um, that, 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 that was the way to experience, um, experience the loss. Um, that's, yeah. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's one of those cultures that, you know, you have a very specific location for, right? Like you can't just pop up in some random other place. You have to have, you know, kind of the infrastructure to make it happen. So did just out of curiosity is, are there still ranks that are uh, featuring this kind of dance skating well, or. I mean, obviously right now everything's shut down. Right. Um, and the skating has moved outside, which is great, but it's a different kind of skating. Um, so the the indoor rinks that, um, that are left uh, are just on hold. You know, I don't know if they'll survive this. Uh, I, I don't know. We're all kind of waiting to see what happens. The rinks that are owned, you know, are, are owned by families and whatever will probably stay open, but the rinks that are rented, I'm not sure that they can they can survive this. Um, in fact, and I say rinks, it's actually just one rink. Um, that's World on Wheels. Um, and then the other rinks on the real outskirts of Los Angeles or in other counties outside LA, um, there's only a few and we'll, yeah, we'll see. But it's just, everything has changed in the last few months. Yeah. It's really strange to watch the movie right now, actually, because it's all about people skating indoors and large crowds of people and you see. <laughs> Seems like mm. that's never going to happen again. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for capturing it because it's an important piece of history and community, and I hope it survives in some form. So thank you for capturing that. Yeah. So Santiago, uh, your film Chinese Wall, talk a little bit about kind of the potential loss uh, as well as how you came up with the story for this film because I think your film tackles it in a very different way. It was uh, a really odd way of uh, kind of like starting a film. I had to, for a subject in university, start filming something. We felt like I simply have to film. And I knew that I wanted to film with the people which later uh, performed in the movie, that it's Fernando Susana. Uh, and I wanted to film our conversations simply uh, uh, regarding any subject. So I chose kind of like this uh, impending death because I thought it would like kind of like uh, help them to like loosen up and start talking, and I started filming our conversations um, uh, and see like what would show up on on the screen. I started filming that, and I actually filmed the movie twice because I filmed it the first time with them like improvising and whatever and talking about life or death or whatever is in between. And uh, I finished it. I had like the seventeen minutes of film, and I said, okay, uh, the, the image was very bad, specifically the sound. And I said, there's something more in here. But I, I was trying to find out which was the best way to keep that kind of like uh, raw kind of material that was their improvisation and our casual conversation. Uh, 
but managed to capture it in like a, a more I don't know if it's a professional fashion. I, I don't I'm not convinced about that word, but I, I wanted to like to take it further. Um, so uh, I took the movie, I uh, translated that to a script, and then sat with them with the script and kind of like wanted to bring life back to it. Uh, um, and it's, it was quite interesting that uh, uh, they ended up saying like almost entirely different words, but the, the background was still the same. And I still managed to keep those conversations, even though the subject, like uh, fortunately no one is dying, but their opinions would be the same as if someone was. was. And uh, uh, suddenly in, in, in the middle of this, uh, uh, this uh, COVID situation, it, it regains another, like, I, I, I heard, a, sorry if I mispronounce your name, Helki, uh, talking about how they weren't, it, it, it's so odd watching all these people skating and, uh, and so on. And for me, it's like, okay, uh, I'm kind of like filming what was going to be uh, uh, staying inside, being afraid of going out, uh, talking about death constantly, like, uh, uh, dwelling like uh, in the same conversation on and on and i think it was it was interesting because i don't know it's it's all almost like um uh how do you call it? like from a prophecy like uh, you can like a uh, uh, foreshadow what was going to happen not not regarding the pandemic on itself but how we were going to uh to approach it that it's in a very similar fashion that it's like a certain level of fear of death and a certain level of you know uh, consciousness and also like okay what what do we want to do with our time and what are our possibilities and just because we have possibilities doesn't mean we have to take them and so on i don't know if i was clear I yeah know. no absolutely i mean you know bringing up kind of the covid situation it, it, it all of your films do kind of have this added layer because we're all mourning the loss of normalcy at least what we thought was normal and um I, I, I just think that all your films kind of touch upon that in some way. So thank you. Thank you, Santiago. So, all right, my next question for you, um, a little bit more about filmmaking is, you know, all of your projects, they, they got pretty deep at, at various points. And I'm curious, while making the films, what did, what did it teach you about your style of filmmaking? About, did it give you any new perspectives on film in general of how to make a film on what it is to make your type of film and we'll start with pat and jamil yeah that's a, um i realized i didn't even introduce myself the first time as well but <laughs> I'm jamil. um yeah that's a that's a wonderful question um i think i think what we did find through our process was we did find a little bit of what it was I think first what we wanted to make sure that we focused on was what it was that we wanted to tell. And we let that then dictate how we kind of approached the project itself. Um, I think from the project, we've definitely learned, or at least for myself, I've learned that we essentially use the fabric of this community. So all the guys that you see in the film, um, they're like first time actors, um, like nothing, like the party that they went to, the house that we shot in, like that's actually Shaq's house. Um, the party they went to, that was like, you know, a party house that they used to always party in when they were young. The friends, the connections, it's, I mean, they've been friends since childhood. So all these elements that couldn't really be recreated, uh, we, we use that. We, we use the advantage of what that brings and it brings this such a, this type of com this camaraderie that couldn't be fabricated if we were to traditionally find actors to then play these roles. Um, and I think even just understanding the fabric of that community and how it was so deep rooted in such a like beautiful dance culture and um, every element that kind of comes with that and the brotherhood that they formed within that, it, the process of that really shined to a truth that I think Pat and I really cling to. And um, it's, it's, it's this thing, it's this kind of thing that you get with individuals who are first time actors or, or haven't acted previously, um, that it, it, the layer of their connection didn't come from us picking one person from here and one person from here and trying to create an environment. We were somewhat approaching the environment as it already existed um, and came there with a story in which we wanted to tell around this world. So it was almost like 
blending this idea of what we had written as a fictional story that was maybe inspired by, you know, personal experiences or what have you um, around an area that is probably the closest depiction of just everyday life and people who have these, these relationships. And I think in that process, I know for me, I found that I, I kind of love the idea of that duality of taking something that could be a fictional story and blending it with a real world canvas. I guess we, we keep coming back to the canvas, but it's kind of very in line with some of the filmmakers that we adore, uh, like Abbas Kiarostami, where he takes stories or a type of structure of a story of what he wants to tell and then finds that individual or that vessel that can tell it and will kind of take his script as more of a blueprint and use that as his guiding light to kind of maneuver his way through through um, a real area and I think um, that that type of filmmaking approach just it kind of gets to this truth that it starts to ask questions beyond the film um, of you know is this someone's real, real house are these real forged relationships did his brother actually pass away things that you couldn't ask for maybe a more traditional style of approaching a way of a film. And I think that those questions are such important ones that the audience then has to kind of deal with and ask themselves and then try to come to their own conclusion on, conclusion on things. And I think that those questions will only come up because of the process we took. Mm -hmm. And I think that process really shined a light to the type of approaches to stories that I think are really that really, I guess for myself, that are really profound and, and, and deep, so. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That resonates very deeply, of course. Um, you know, I, I've, Jamil, you bringing up influences also makes me think about just what a long process it was for us to find what Gramercy became, you know, through the development process. And I think, you know, we, Eric, we, we started with, uh, uh you know if, if you've seen the film it's it, half the film is in color and half the film is in black and white and the stuff in black and white is kind of the grounded physical world that Shaq is in and then the stuff in the color is kind of what's going on in his um subconscious uh or his emotional life and it's you know representations in in you know lush beautiful nature and so when Jamil and I kind of had decided on those two frameworks to develop the film, a lot of natural influences came up. So, you know, we did a lot of pulling from Wong Kar Wai and uh, Jamil mentioned Abbas and um, Andre Tarkovsky and Wim Wenders and a lot of these, you know, Lynn Ramsey, a lot of these filmmakers who, you know, you take a little bit of this from them and a little bit of that and you I say, wow, that, that really moved me. And, you know, I think overall, I, I think the, pr the process of making Gramercy, I, I think I for me personally, I figured out where I fit into all the, the cinema that I love and what it means to be kind of the amalgamation of all of your influences plus your own personal experience and kind of how you filter those things through. And, you know, I was, when we were watching the film, there was a, a wonderful drive-in screening uh, that we got to do in, in Queens in New York um, a couple weeks ago and just watching the film in a cinema for the first time because we haven't had the chance with, you know, I don't know if anyone's heard, but there's this big global <laughs> pandemic happening right now. Uh, and uh, it, I was really, um, I felt this incredible, both distance and familiarity watching the movie. Like I was watching a version of a of something that my past self had made who had watched all of these films that had been so influenced. And then yet I, I almost had felt like I was creating space then for my older self now to watch it and feel something. So there was all this wonderful space that I feel this younger version of myself made for me today to watch the movie and think, wow, look at, look, look at all these things that you love and all of these, all of these, uh, all of these, um, you know, ideas that you had and and all these beautiful amazing people who helped to make it happen um so i think to be honest it sounds like a big statement but i think i really learned why i ever wanted to be a filmmaker in the first place and be a writer in the first place is, is kind of not i think i when we started making grammar see jamil i think I, I had all these expectations as to what i thought i wanted the movie to be and i i had all these ideas this movie's going to be this this and that and 
the process of making Gramercy was really just dropping all of that and just letting things happen and being present for them and listening to yourself in the moment and not about what you think you wanted. You know, well, I thought I wanted the movie to be this. Well, I thought, you know, this scene was going to be like this. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's like the best filmmaking. It's, it's you, you got to just listen to what's in front of you and, and where yeah. you're at now. And so that was, that was, uh, that's uh, my long, my long one to the answer uh-huh. to your question, Eric. Well, what a, what a great lesson to learn. So, oh man, the, yeah. the, the, the most important lesson. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes and, you got uh, Dominga and, oh, I'm sorry. No, sorry. I was just going to, to Pat's point. Sometimes we're the pro, what you're saying, Pat, is like the pro, it's almost like the world itself is pushing you to go down a certain process as opposed to a process you're trying to impose on it. I mean, mm. for instance, like we were, force to kind of shift the script as we were shooting it just given to what happened on set um mm-hmm. and it's, it's almost like we used what was in front of us as opposed to this fictionalized ideology of what we wanted it to be mm-hmm. and i think that would have in turn trapped us into a thing that we potentially might not have wanted to make so yeah it's it's it was truly being open to what that process was as it right. came and so, Dominga and Carla, your film is already very kind of intimate, and uh, there's a specific craft to it based on the the nature of, of correspondence. So, what what do you feel like you learned from the process of doing this very specific kind of project? Yeah, to be honest, I don't know if I can talk too long about this. I mean, it was <laughs> it was something so so fast, so spontaneous, and it's what I like in the process. I've been making fiction, maybe, may, mostly, like feature films, short films, by like fictions. And this is this was totally different. It was just letters, you know, very spontaneous. Uh, at the beginning, when I knew that uh, it's going to be a short film, I thought maybe I have to re- re-edit it <laughs> because I, I made it like in a day, and then the sound was really bad but then, like that it was just what happened in that moment is when it's like when you write a letter you can rewrite it but then the most honest thing is just to send it how it was at the beginning no so yeah but but makes me connect with this kind of handmade film that i really like sometimes like big productions are really takes a lot of time it's a lot of energy with many people and i love like the idea of making cinema with your hands and something that you can do alone also and and for yeah and also i mean i finished the last letter when it was the social uprising in chile in october and it was a it was a very tough moment where i was asking myself why to do fiction why to do films uh, I, I don't know, when, when life gets so complicated, then you don't understand why you are doing what you're doing. And, and I don't think that after that and after COVID, I will make the same kind of fictions. So I think this was also kind of a transition project where I, I don't imagine myself directing the same kind of project or at least not in the same way. And I wanted to, I, I hope to be focused always in working with a little group of people or trying to make it as simple, as familiar, or as handmade as possible. Mm, I like that. What about you, Carla? Anything to add? No, it was quite the same, actually. So it's like I learned about freedom, basically. So when you, you prepare a fiction film, you, you know, like you're like three, four years developing script and then preparing and finding actors or non-actors. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of people and a lot of money, you know? Mm -hmm. So suddenly if on a side you can uh, just take your camera alone and go and film something just because like, you know, like the joy of filming and finding images that matter to you, to me this really reconnects me with the, you know, like the, my desire to make films, you know, because there is nothing in the way. It's just like you and your camera. And and for me, it was very interesting the fact that um, I usually in my fictions, I, I have a big, big family. So in my fictions, I speak about them a lot. <laughs> and I mm-hmm. adapt to things that have happened in my family. And, and this time I showed them. So just very simply, you know, like just kind of a portrait of them. Um, but it was also very beautiful to, you know, just be with these people that I love and film them. And I do that a lot with my, you know, like my little camera, but to do it also in Super 8, that uh, the f- like it was the first 
time I shot in Super 8, so it was also a learning in, in that sense. And, and then after that, I shot a lot more in Super 8 because I think that there is something that we don't have in digital is the fact that you think about what you are going to shoot. And when you are alone with your Super 8 camera and before shooting, you think, like to me, this is really making film, <laughs> you know? So it was, um, yeah, it was also very, like the whole thing was very spontaneous and, and it's like a handcraft, you know? And, and I wish I could have, you know, like cut <laughs> the film. I actually edited in in my laptop, but I don't know. It just, uh, yeah, it connects you with uh, with the origins of, of filmmaking, you know? And, and realizing that with just little, you can do a lot and you can express really deep emotions and sometimes you don't need like uh, 3 million and 100 people <laughs> to make a film because it's still a film. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to add that I like this idea of be reacting of what happened also. I mean, you can have like a plan to make a feature film, but in the middle, Carla sent me a this invitation and I really like this idea of going like not going in one line, like doing a feature film, but then a short film, but then this kind of an experiment thing. Like, I think this is the way that I, that I, that I really want to keep working. Like, like, I don't know, mixing kind of projects, some small, some big, some, yeah. Yes, and it's also good when you, think, when you don't know where it's gonna go, because you know, like I did this first letter, then Dominga answered, and then I reacted to that, and she reacted to that. So at like, we didn't know what was going to come out. Actually, we didn't even know that it would become a short film. Yeah, so, no, no. no, so it just, you know, like filming because you have a desire to find some images at this moment of your life and related to something that is going on in you. So, and I think that this is very good to, to be doing that meanwhile you do uh, yeah. like maybe bigger things. <laughs> Well, it's very cool to see how it all kind of came together because you can, mm -hmm. with your film, you can definitely see the pieces mm -hmm. and then you can see how it all comes together. And so I think you did a very good job of that. So thank you. Um, Helki. Um, well, I mean, I came, I came into this project not really knowing that much about filmmaking. Um, and uh, we set out to make a feature film and filmed for years and had a lot of material to work with, but in the end got really limited by our budget and, ha and made a short. Um, and so I, I guess, uh, I mean, I learned, but really what, what I came out of this with is that I learned to, to use a camera <laughs> and um, and I became a cinematographer really because of this film and um, and so I and 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 I learned about how I like to film um, and how I like to use a camera and how important um, relationships are for me you know in filming I, I mean I only film documentaries but uh, the really you know relationships with um, everybody, you know, who, who I'm working with, but also with the people we're filming. And that, I guess, yeah, just sort of clarified what I want to do with my life. Um, but I, I, I and, and also, I learned everything about making a film. And I learned about what's really hard about making a film, a documentary film with a very small budget. Um, and uh, uh, not, yeah. So it's kind of like I learned equally what I don't want to do again. <laughs> like I, 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 I mean, I, I, I'll probably do a few more projects in my life, but I, I, I think that I'm pretty wary of taking on big documentary <laughs> directing projects <laughs> the last years and years. Yeah. That's a great lesson to learn, though. As yeah. Well. <laughs> Very humbling. <laughs> yeah, humbling and time-saving, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. And then uh, Santiago, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of how the process of making this film, what it taught you about making film? Yeah, sure. Um, it taught me specifically how intimidating a camera and a crew can be. Uh, these were also first-time actors or non-actors, or however we want to define them. And me as well, I didn't want to act it. I ended up acting only because the other two, Fernando Susana wouldn't have acted if I wasn't the other character. So 
I was in the middle of that, acting, directing in a very intimate, um, uh, limited group. Like I didn't want a lot of people because I knew how intimate it was going to be. And it was even more. And it was interesting to see the difference between filming it the first time, which with a reflex camera, very little in a corner, and the difference between that and having a full-size um, movie camera, 14 people walking around, uh, having to have a, a microphone on, on, or, you know, you can't look at camera, but you can't also look at light, for example. And uh, until you're on the other side, perhaps you wouldn't learn that. And it was, it was interesting. And in, it undoubtedly affects the, what's going on and uh, this uh, natural feeling of it and trying to, to, to learn how to control it, though control it still isn't the best word for it, it was quite interesting, like how to manage those, um, those emotions and try to feel like, okay, uh, I have left uh, the realness of this. I have undoubtedly left it at the first time I filmed it. Now I have to like work with fiction and it's full fiction and I must forget what a, what a visual thing I, I managed like to capture before and now like turn it to where I wanted to go because if not, the anxiety and the nervousness of having this uh, crew uh, on top of you uh, would have left me with a, an awful result. So I had to like work with what I had and it was interesting like that contrast. Uh, and. Uh, and it's kind of silly, like we all know it, but how you can some, tell someone to act as yourself. Uh, uh, as I was uh, telling Fernando Susana to act as themselves, uh, Julian Bustelo, that was my, my assistant director and uh, director of photography, uh, was telling to me, you're not being yourself, like not a single bit, and how I should uh, change my, like the ways I speak, the way I move my face and so on. And like, he he would shape the version of me that I was wanting and I would shape the version of Fernando Susana like I was picturing it. And uh, at the end, like you, you're editing it and you realize you can only get close or so close or so far from what you wanted, but you can never get what you wanted. That is actually interesting because uh, like the film ends and always, will always end up being something else as movies, movies are always something else and not on, it, on themselves, which is quite ironical. Uh, whatever you project or you plan for three years, two years, one and a half or whatever, will the end result ends up being something different and it's kind of fascinating. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's clear that we could all keep talking about these movies forever, I think. Uh, there's so much to get into. I think we got into some deep stuff. So thank you guys so much for joining. Just wanted to remind our audience that they can screen these films until the end of the festival. So tell your friends, tell your families. If you got something amazing from these movies, if you want uh, to watch any of our shorts, they're all going to be available through the end of the festival. And we'd love to hear from everybody on social media. So you can find us at AFI Fest or hashtag AFI Fest, and uh, we can start that conversation. And then also uh, we've got obviously a ton of other programming that we've very proud to share with everyone. So please, please, please go to fest.afi.com and uh, read all about the other projects that you are gonna get to enjoy. So thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, you were incredible. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be in your, all thank your you. presence. Thank you. It's such an honor. <laughs> thank Bye. you.